Okay. Um, welcome everyone uh, to the third uh, chapter, the multiple uh, regression model. Um, so in this uh, particular chapter, we're going to extend our knowledge on a regression model. And in particular, we're going to do uh, more than just, um, you know, regression on more than just one, uh, two variables. So in the previous meeting, we um, discussed about the methodology and then the underlying assumptions on simple linear regression. So basically, this is a regression where we regress y on x. And um, in this lecture, we're going to try to extend the model uh, to include not only y and x, but also other relevant um, exponential variables into the model. Okay. Um, so I'll start with the motivation, uh, and I'm hoping that you guys will be able to participate. So in this uh, simple regression model, um, so we have yi uh, beta 0 plus beta 1 xi. So y, again, uh, this is going to be the uh, dependent variable. And then x is going to be the independent variable. And u um, is going to denote factors that we do not observe uh, that may correlate with y. And in some cases, it could also correlate with x. Okay, So one of the aim of a simple linear regression is to obtain OLS estimates for the beta 1. Okay. So again, uh, beta one is something that we do not see. We do not observe the value. This is something uh, which is a characteristic of a population. And then we're gonna try to get a sample and then using the sample, we're going to estimate uh, beta one, okay? And then the estimate um, is referred to as beta one hat, okay? So please recall the difference between beta one and then beta one hat the difference between u and then um, u hat, uh, those they have a very important distinction and then important differences. So make sure that uh, you guys will uh, understand that, okay? And so given the simple linear regression assumptions, assumptions one, uh, linear and parameter, and then uh, random sampling, and then variability in the value of x, um, as well as the zero conditional mean assumptions, then uh, we can be sure that beta one is an unbiased estimate of beta one, okay? And another important feature is that unbiased doesn't mean that it has to be equal to beta one. Uh, unbiasedness is a property of, um, you know, repeated sampling. And so the idea is that if you're able to do repeated sampling, then the average of the beta one hat is going to be equal to the beta one, okay? So as long as we, uh, fulfill the assumptions, then we can be sure that um, the estimates of beta one hat is actually an unbiased estimate of beta one. Now, what we're going to do today is try to actually extend the model. But before we extend the model, I just want to go and have a um, relatively short discussion. And so in this particular example, I have the birth weight on the left hand side. So birth weight represents infant birth weight in ounces. And then I have six on the right hand side. So six represents average number of cigarettes the mother smoked per day during pregnancy. Okay. Now, what I want you guys to discuss is that whether the model, whether the simple model allows an estimation of the causal effect of smoking during pregnancy on children birth weight. Okay. Um, any thoughts, any um, inputs, any ideas, suggestions? Please unmute yourself um, and then um, go ahead and then uh, give your thoughts. Anyone? Okay, uh, Thoric, uh, do you think that there is a uh, do you think that the simple model allows estimation of the causal effect of smoking during pregnancy? Uh, oh, sir, can you hear my voice? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so I think, um, I'm not really sure, but maybe there are a strong correlation between smoking cigarettes and uh, lighter babies. I believe that uh, when you smoke, um, your your babies cannot gain enough oxygen therefore they may they might be developing slower than if the mother is healthy 
I believe that. Okay, so uh, the question is, will, will it be able to identify the causal effect of smoking or do you think it won't be able to? I think uh, we can um, by this model, I think we can. Okay, um, other thoughts, um, other um, opinions? May I try? Sure, go ahead, please. Okay, uh, I think this regression uh, shows the causal relationship between the two variables, but however, there are also other unobserved variables that may affect uh, birth weight, such as, uh, for example, the pregnancy duration, sir. Okay, all right. Um, I'll just, um, you know, get a get opinion from one more student. Thank you for sharing, Mazaya um, and Thorik. Um, just one more. Do you think the model, the simple model, would allow estimation of the causal effect of smoking? Or perhaps I can rephrase it differently. What will be the condition or what will be the assumption such that the model will allow causal estimation of uh, the effect of smoking during pregnancy? All right, just one more. Um, Kayandra. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, do you? Uh, what would be the assumption, or what would be the conditions such that we would be able to identify the effect of smoking on children' birth weight? Wait, sorry, sir. Can you repeat the question? Sure. So, what would be the assumptions or the conditions such that we will be able to estimate the causal effect of smoking on children' birth weight? Mm. The assumption is that when, uh, when chill, oh, when, wait, so small, uh, smoking causes, uh, causes a, how do I say, uh, uh, smoking will decrease the birth rate of children. Okay, so I was I was actually asking about the assumption. Okay, so um, all right, so I'll probably just go ahead and discuss this. Um, so in this particular model, uh, what do we want to identify? What we'd like to identify is whether or not we'll be able to get the causal effect of smoking, which is the number of cigarettes uh, consumed per day, on uh, the children birth weight. Okay, the idea is that. Uh, smoking will not only be um, dangerous for your own health, but also on the uh, fetus's health, okay? And so um, the hypothesis is that a higher number of cigarettes smoked per day during the pregnancy is going to lower the birth weight, okay? Now the question is, uh, will we be able to identify the causal effect of smoking on the birth weight? Um, or um, if even if we do, what will be the assumption, okay? So, so to make it easier, uh, always recall uh, the key assumption or the key condition uh, such that we will have an unbiased estimate on the cigarettes effect, okay? And the assumption is something that we discussed uh, last week, which is the zero conditional mean assumption, okay? So what does it say, okay? So the zero conditional mean assumption says that, um, so individuals who smoke or mothers who smoke and those who don't, have similar characteristics, okay? So uh, smoking or not, is just an exogenous variation, okay? And we all know that it's not true, right? Um, so smoking is not something that is exogenous. Smoking is actually a choice, okay? And the choice could be correlated with different characteristics, both characteristics that we, uh, that we observe and then characteristics that we do not observe, okay? Now, if, we can if we if we if we are able to identify a characteristic such that a cigarette consumption is actually different between two groups of individuals, then 
it's, you know, we can show that uh, the estimate of the secret effect will be biased, okay? So now what I want you guys to do is identify what are unobservable, okay? So something that we do not observe in this model that will be correlated with birth weight as well as the number of cigarettes smoked per day. Any ideas? Maybe, sir. Sure, go ahead. Maybe nutrition, sir. Okay. Um, so, okay, good. So nutrition. So nutrition is going to uh, definitely affect um, the birth weight. So how do you think, if, if you cannot find a variable on nutrition, what would be another proxy for nutrition? Or what would be another variable that may allow you to identify um, you know, uh, the, the, the nutrition that the mother or the baby would get? Uh, I oh. think wealth, sir. Wealth. Okay. All right. Uh, good. Uh, so wealth is a proxy. Zaki, do you have uh, other idea? Uh, no, I was just complimenting uh, Jovana. I said uh, household expenditure. Okay. So ex expenditure, it's wealth. Zaki, do you have an idea as well? Uh, for the proxy uh, for nutrition, sir? Uh, no, I, I was actually, actually, sorry. I was actually referring to Ahmad Zaki. Go ahead, Ahmad. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Because uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't think I have a clear connection. Okay. So Jovan said that, um, you know, a proxy for nutrition would be wealth. Um, and then Muhammad Zaki also mentioned that, uh, you know, per, cap per capita expenditure uh, could be a good proxy. To so do you have any idea on other variables that uh, could proxy nutrition intake or maybe other variables that we do not observe in this model and it's correlated with birth weight? Uh, maybe, uh, I guess the level of education of the mother could also be the variable that affect birth weight. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The mother, yeah. the better understanding of, you know, uh, how to have a good, uh, you know, pregnancy. Yeah, very good. So, um, you know, we can think of um, education, we can think of, um, you know, per capita expenditure, we can think of wealth uh, to be variables that we do not observe in this model. And it could be correlated not only to the birth weight, okay, uh, but also to the number of cigarettes smoke. Okay, so I think education is a very good example. I think wealth and uh, per capita expenditure are also both uh, very good examples. So the idea is that, um, you know, individuals with higher income, uh, they uh, have a higher likelihood to give better nutritional in, uh, inputs for their mothers and for the babies. And uh, at the same time, uh, individuals who are richer uh, may be able to get uh, or to buy or to purchase uh, more cigarettes. So uh, if that's the case, then the estimate of uh, the cigarette effect will be biased. Okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you an example with the software uh, later on, uh, but that's going to be the idea of this lecture. If you can understand that one uh, slide and then the idea of that one slide, then you'll be able to understand uh, most of the uh, kind of like the core principles that we're going to discuss in chapter three. That's why I spent a lot of time um, looking at the uh, first slide, uh, because that's going to be the key uh, for you to be able to understand uh, the idea of uh, issues discussed in chapter three. Okay. All right. So again, basically, I'm going back. Um, I'm going back uh, to the assumption. I'm sorry. I don't know if this is... Hi guys, I think I lost my connection. Uh, sorry for the trouble. I'm going to try to reconnect.
All right. Um, so I'm going to um, I'm going to continue. Um, sorry for the delay. All right. So the idea is that assumptions one uh, until assumptions four must be fulfilled in order for us to be able to recover uh, beta one from the data. Okay. So the fourth assumption, which is uh, the zero conditional mean assumption, is often violated. Okay. So a simple linear regression model ignores other potential determinants of y. So since the zero conditional mean assumption may not hold for many reasons, it is necessary to study a more complex model. Okay. So for example, you guys have given um, you know illustrations on how uh, there are unobserved uh, characteristics that are not only correlated with birth weight, but also correlated with the number of cigarettes smoked. Okay, so for example, a more educated parent, uh, they will be able to, um, you know, provide uh, better nutritional inputs for the kids, uh, for the babies, uh, but at the same time, more educated individuals are less likely uh, to smoke. Okay, and so um, the estimated effect that we're seeing from the cigarette smoke is not clear whether this is the effect of smoking and smoking alone, or it's actually the effect of smoking and the fact that uh, you know, people have different knowledge. Okay, so that's the idea of the zero conditional mean. Um, and if we violate the zero condition, conditional mean assumption, then uh, we won't be able to identify the causal effect of smoking on um, birth weight. Okay, so the idea of multiple linear regression is that we want to include more than one regressor. Regressor. So OLS estimation is computationally efficient even with high dimensional x. Okay, so we did a regression with one variable. And today we're going to do a regression uh, not only on y and x, but also on y and x and x2, x3, x4, and so on. Okay. So the good thing about OLS is that it's computationally efficient. Okay. So even if you include, say, um, 5,000 explanatory variables, uh, your computer will actually run the regression quite quick. Okay. So uh, the idea is that they're using uh, matrix algebra uh, to conduct the estimation. So it's very, very fast. Okay. Now, uh, we want to add variable uh, such that the multiple linear regression allows us to explicitly control. Okay, so it allows us to explicitly control for many other factors that simultaneously affect the dependent variable. So you mentioned that per capita expenditure or per capita income, education are actually important variables that the multiple linear regression allow us not only to use cigarette smoke per day, but also the level of schooling of the parents, as well as the uh, per capita expenditure. Okay. Another reason why we want to add variable is that we want to have better variation of y um, in the model. Okay. Uh, and so if we if 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 the model has you know if if a higher share of the variation of the data can be explained by the variation of the model, then we can have a better prediction from the model. Okay. All right, so the assumptions as well as the estimation procedure are essentially the same in the simple uh, regression model. Uh, however, there are massive differences and then massive advantages on estimation on the multiple linear regression, okay? All right, before, um, you know, before I uh, start uh, to do another example, any questions first? All right, so I'm going to go to Stata, um, and then um, we're going to discuss um, the first example, which is test score and per student spending. Okay. All right, so any idea uh, what would be the estimated sign uh, beta one in this regression? Okay, so if you regress the average score on expenditure uh, per student in the school at the school level, um, what would be the sign of the regression? Or what would be the sign of beta one? Any thoughts? Anyone wants to share? Can I try to share? Sure, go ahead. Uh, maybe in this case, a uh, higher expenditure can be a proxy for higher family income, meaning that they're more likely to have higher test scores because they would also have better access to educational resources and private tutors. So I would assume the sign to be positive, I guess. 
Okay, so yes, so the higher, um, you know, the expenditure, uh, then it means that uh, there are higher, say, uh, better facilities, uh, they can fund uh, and hire better teachers, um, you know, they can have better instructional uh, materials and stuff like that. And so uh, on average, uh, students who are in better quality schools or like uh, schools with uh, better expenditure, uh, they're more likely to have um, higher scores. And so we see that uh, positive correlation. Okay, so another question is that uh, so far we only regress average score and um, you know per student expenditure. Uh, can you guys think about other variables that may be correlated with student test score? May I, sir? Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead, yeah. I think it's family background. Okay, can you provide a reasoning on why family background would be an important uh, feature? Um, family background could be um, regarded as, um, let's say, maybe correlated as well to the um, income as well, and uh, maybe problems uh, between the family as well, so to the scores. Okay, all right, good. So, so that's the idea, right? Um, um, the idea is that um, you know, families with, um, you know, better, better educated father and then better, better education, uh, educated mother, they know the value of education. And so since they know the value of education, they provide more resources, uh, they provide a better motivation for their children and so on. So that on average, uh, students, um, you know, with better, better educated father and mothers are more likely to do better in schools. And so that's the idea of, um, you know, family background, one of the idea. Another one would be like the amount of, um, you know, educational inputs and then educational resources that are spent by their parents uh, and the families to support the educational process of their children, okay? Like, you know, a subscription of uh, video channels and then internet accesses, um, and then access to learning materials such as books. Um, and then perhaps nowadays you can access Wang Guru or you can access uh, Xenius and stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, higher family resources um, is also correlated with um, better outcomes. Okay. Uh, just one more um, while I also start up the um, this data. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so basically, I did share several. Um, I did uh, share several um, do files and then R scripts um, in Elloc, and so you can download them. Uh, you can take a look at it, and then you can play around with the data. Um, you can actually explore what hasn't been explored uh, in this lecture, and so that you get a better idea of you know um, writing codes and then doing syntaxes in Stata and uh, and in R. And that's going to provide you with a better sense of um, data analysis uh, in general. All right. So anyway, um, from this data set, um, I can describe uh, the contents of the data set. We have uh, the main variable of interest, which, which will be the average uh, test score uh, in each school. And then uh, we have the expenditure per student. We have the student teacher ratio. And then we have the average income of uh, the parents. So this is uh, what Dia was referring to that, um, you know, uh, family resources and then uh, family background uh, is an important variable. All right, so I guess uh, with all the uh, analysis, the first thing that I like to do is just uh, to grab all the variables um, in the data. So it could be like a, um, you know, distributional um, plot, it could be like a correlation matrix. It could be a box plot. So these uh, figures and this uh, analysis will allow us to better understand, um, you know, the variable uh, themselves as well as how uh, the variables correlate with each other. Okay. So the first thing that I'm going to do is actually do a uh, kernel density graph. So kernel density graph is a uh, graph that allow us to actually um, that actually allow us to um show the uh distribution of the data set okay or the, the, the variable okay. i don't know if you're able to see this so i'm gonna uh, try to switch and then share uh, the monitor instead okay and so if i run um if i run the um if i run the uh, code this is what i'm gonna get i'm gonna get a distribution of uh average test score across schools okay and you can see that although it's not you know 
um, perfectly normal, uh, it's actually very, very, very close to normal distribution, okay? And then you can do that for other variables in the model. Say, for example, uh, you can do that for a student to teacher ratio, for example. And then uh, you can also get a sense on how the student and teacher ratio is actually distributed. And they're pretty normally distributed, uh, which is quite exciting, okay? And you can do that for all other variables as, as long as they're in the interval or they're in the ratio um, you know, level of measurement, okay? Another matrix that I like to you know, graph is actually the correlation matrix. Um, so it's a graph matrix and then test score, uh, student-teacher ratio, uh, expenditure per student, as well as average income, okay? And so um, from these, you can actually get, um, you know, better uh, understanding on how uh, variables are correlated with each other. So I can also do like different scheme just, you know, to uh, make sure that I have a better, uh, you know, uh, better looking graphic. Uh, that's something that you can do as well. Um, and so instead of just using the Stata default uh, graphic, um, I can use uh, a lot of other um, templates out there. All right, so um, the way that I'm going to um, identify the correlation is that by looking at each matrix. So for example, uh, I wanna know what's the correlation between test score and student teacher ratio. And then I'm gonna look, be looking at this uh, plot right here. If I wanna understand the relationship between test score and uh, say, for example, uh, test score and average income. And this is going to be the graph that uh, I'll be looking at. And so in this particular, uh, particular graph, we can see that there is somewhat a positive correlation between test score and average income. So this is something that uh, you've mentioned before, uh, you know, schools with um, better family background, in this case, better or higher uh, income, um, you know, it's correlated with um, test score. Okay, so these are some of the things that uh, you can do before you actually do uh, the regression, okay? All right, so uh, to do the regression itself, it's actually uh, very simple. You can do the regress um, syntax, or in Stata, you can actually uh, do abbreviation, okay? So in this case, I'm going to regress test score on expenditure per student, for example, okay? And uh, some of you mentioned that, uh, you know, it should be positively correlated, okay? Um, and then we do the regression. And then after we do the regression, uh, we can identify uh, the coefficient, okay? Um, and so a higher expenditure per student is positively correlated with test score, okay? Now, what I want you to do is pay attention uh, to the coefficient of the expenditure per student Okay, and then um, observe what will be the coefficient. Suppose that I add another explanatory variable. In this particular case, I'm going to add, say, student to teacher ratio. Okay, now before I add student teacher ratio to the uh, model, what will be the correlation between the expenditure per student in the school and then the student teacher ratio? Is it, are they positively correlated? Are they negatively correlated? Or do you think that there is no uh, correlation at all? What do you guys think? Anyone? Okay, so student-teacher ratio. Um, so more students um, per, uh, per teacher is seen to be less preferable uh, because now one, one teacher act is actually teaching more uh, students, okay? So suppose that uh, we add this, then look at the coefficient for the expenditure per student. So in the previous regression, the estimated coefficient was 0 0.0057, okay? In the current regression, the estimated coefficient is 0 0.0024, okay? Which is quite different. So the current estimate of the expenditure per student is actually half of the estimate in the previous model, okay? Now, this is an illustration for um, all of you that, you know, if we forget to include variables that not only correlates with test score, but also correlate with expenditure per student, then the estimated coefficient of the expenditure per student 
could be bias. Okay, and although we don't know uh, the value of the bias, and since we don't know the value of the parameter, but if there is a drastic change in the estimated coefficient of the expenditure per student, as we see in this case, then that's one of the indication of, um, of uh, bias, okay? We can also add uh, another variable. So for example, we can add test score, expenditure per student, student teacher ratio, as well as average income um, of the parents uh, in, the, uh, in each school, okay? Oops, my bad. Okay, and then we'll add um, the regression. Oh, I'm still leaving out one more. So reg, test score, um, and then um, expenditure per student, and then student teacher ratio, as well as average income, okay? Um, and then after I add average income, um, you know, we can observe, uh, you know, that the coefficients have changed, okay? So in the previous one, uh, the coefficient for expenditure per student was 0 0.02. And then the expected or the estimated coefficient for student teacher ratio was negative 1.76. And now it's a bit different. Okay, so um, the estimated coefficient for the expenditure per student, okay, um, is actually uh, now negative. Okay, again, so it's actually now negative. Uh, previously, it was positive. Okay, um, and then um, average income is now positive. Okay. So I guess this is another interesting aspect is that if you fail to include important variables in the regression, not only that your estimated coefficient will be biased, but it could also change sign, okay? So initially in the initial model, the estimated coefficient was positive, but then after you include average income, then the estimated expenditure per student is actually now negative, okay? Can anyone provide an intuition on why after you add average income to the model, the estimated expenditure per student is actually now negative? Any thoughts, any intuition? So the intuition is that expenditure per student and average income is very highly correlated, okay? And so you can think that uh, parents with higher income, uh, parents from uh, more affluent neighborhoods, tend to send their kids to schools with better resources, okay? Um, students coming from um, wealthy uh, families tend to be sent to school with higher expenditure per student, okay? And so when you fail to control average income, then what happens is that um, the expenditure per student effect actually also encompasses the effect of the average income. And once you add average income to the model, then it will um, you know, allow uh, the model to estimate the effect of expenditure per student um, and just expenditure per student, and then an estimate for the average income, okay? So that's the intuition. There is a high correlation between expenditure per student and average income, okay? Any questions on the simple STATA exercise? Hopefully this will allow you to, you know, um, you know get going in the sense of uh, what they need to do in terms, of, um, in terms of the regression. And then what does it mean if we fail to include a particular variable in the regression? Any thoughts, questions? Go ahead. Uh, sir, I have a question. Sure, go ahead, Saki. Uh, since uh, since you mentioned about the failure of uh, incorporating the appropriate uh, variables into the model, uh, I would like to bring uh, bring up to your attention uh, about uh, about how we can control uh, those variables that we explicitly include in the model, uh, like. Uh, like the one that you just performed uh, just now, uh, because in 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 your example, uh, I still uh, don't know how we can uh, control those variables that we take out of the error term in into the uh, into the actual model. Okay, so what I mean by uh, control is that 
we include the variables into the regression model. Okay. So uh, recall that our initial regression was that uh, there is test score um, and then expenditure expenditure uh, per student. Okay. Now in this particular regression model, I fail to include average income um, and then uh, student teacher ratio and other relevant variables that may explain test score, okay? Now, by including them into the model, as long as the data is available, then it means that you're controlling this variable, okay? So by controlling means that you accommodate that uh, the variation of test score could also be driven by student teacher ratio as well as average income. So this is what we mean by uh, control for uh, these variables. Okay. Any and, uh, and by uh, controlling those variables by including them in the model, you reveal uh, how these variables affect the uh, other variables, right? Um, so the variables will not change value, but what we're interested in is to see whether or not the addition of uh, the variables will affect the value of the estimated coefficient. So we're interested in these um, estimated coefficients. So that's the idea. Um, so if you add uh, additional variables that you think are important, uh, and then the estimated coefficient change, then that's an indication that if you don't control for this variable, then the estimated coefficients um, will be biased, or the estimated coefficient of the main variable of interest will be biased. So that's kind of like the idea. Okay, so the point of interest in uh, is in the coefficients. Exactly. Yes. So if you add other variables, the existing variable don't change; the value stays the same, but the estimated coefficient may change. Okay, so that's going to be uh, the idea. All right. Uh, good. Uh, one more question before I go and then discuss the setup of the model. Thank you, sir. Sure. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to share uh, the screen again, and then let's discuss um, the setup. Okay. All right, so the model is now y equals to beta zero plus beta one, x one plus beta two x two plus beta three x three and so on until beta k x k. So what does it mean? Excuse me. So it means that not only we include one explanatory variable x, but we actually include more than just one explanatory variable. So we have x one, we have x two, we have x three and so on until x k. Okay, now um, beta zeros, beta one, beta two, beta three, and so on are still the parameters of the model. Uh, but then uh, we have to be careful in noting that each parameter is actually assigned to different variables. So for example, beta one is associated with X one, beta two is associated with X two and so on. Okay. And so what are the advantages of multiple linear regression? So the advantages of multiple integrations are first, uh, we can incorporate more explanatory factors into the model. Uh, we know that not only expenditure per student that matters, we also know that student teacher ratio matters, the average income of parents matter. And there could actually be other variables that uh, affect student test score that may not be able to be included in the model. Okay, so that's the first reason, the first advantage. The second advantage is that we're going to be able to explicitly hold fix other factors that otherwise will be in you. So the second point or the second advantage is associated with what I said to control for. Okay. So when I say that we control for expenditure per student, or when I say that I control for average income, it means that I'm going to be able um, to explicitly hold fix. Uh, 
um, the expenditure per student and the average income um, of the parents, okay? And the third advantage is that it's going to allow for more flexible functional forms, okay? So in the previous lecture, we know that uh, the main, one of the main uh, disadvantages of a simple linear regression model is that the model doesn't allow um, the model to capture any nonlinear relationship, okay? And so using um, multiple linear regression, we're gonna have more flexible functional forms, okay? So not only that we can regress on X, we can actually also regress on X squared, we can regress on, um, you know, X to the power of three and so on and so forth, okay? So those are the advantages of multiple linear regression. Okay, um, the next point is, Well, I'm having an uh, internet issue on the day, so I apologize for that. Uh, let me try to rebroadcast my, um, my slide. Okay. Yes, so I'm having issues with my um, internet today. I'm not quite sure um, why it's not working, but let me just try one more time. And then um, if it doesn't work, and then I'll try another method. Okay, all right, so this is uh, the model. Oof, very slow, uh, my apology. All right, I'm gonna try whether this is does gonna work or not. Okay, so let me just... Oh, okay, sure. actually it's working. Okay, so um, let me continue. Uh, so the key assumption for the general multiple regression model um, is that uh, the expected uh, value of the unobservables uh, conditional on X1, X2, X3, and so on is going to be zero. So again, this is very similar uh, to the assumption that we saw in the previous chapter. And so, this is actually the same uh, zero uh, conditional mean assumption, okay? So this assumption suggests that all factors in the unobserved error term are uncorrelated with the explanatory variable, okay? So there is no longer correlation between the factors that we do not observe and then explanatory variables, okay? And then um, the zero conditional mean assumption also says that the model have correctly account for the functional relationship between the explained and the explanatory variables, okay? So for example, in the simple linear regression model, you can only regress, um, say, labor market wage on experience, for example. Now in the multiple linear regression model, you can regress labor market wage on experience, and then the square of experience, experience to the power of three, experience to the power of four. And so, the multiple linear regression actually allow us to identify a more flexible functional relationships between labor market wage and then years of working experience in the labor market, okay? Now, again, with, this, uh, with the uh, same concepts that we saw in the zero conditional mean assumption for the simple in, uh, regression model, any problem that causes the unobservable to be correlated with any of the independent variables will cause the key assumption to fail, okay? So that's the idea. So going back to the birth weight example, so if we can find a variable that is correlated with the cigarette smoke per day, then that variable will actually, um, you know, uh, causes the key zero conditional mean assumption to fail. Okay, any question? Uh, before I move on to the next slide. Okay, again, the idea is that, um, you know, there is no longer correlation between the factors that we don't observe and the explanatory variable of interest, okay? So that's the key assumption. So for example, if we have a regression of labor market wage on 
um, education and experience, then we say that there is no other variables that we do not observe that correlates with education and experience. So do you think that this assumption makes sense or not? Any thoughts? Can you think of a variable that you do not observe, which will still be correlated with education and experience? Any thoughts? You know, it could be like innate ability. For example, um, innate ability is unobserved. Um, and innate ability is still correlated with education as well as experience. And so if we leave out innate ability, then there is a big, uh, like a big chance or like a higher probability that the zero conditional mean assumption is not fulfilled, okay? Now, another thing is that, can you identify variables other than expenditure per student and average income that could be correlated with the factors that we do not observe, okay? Now, if you can identify a variable that is correlated with expenditure and average income, then your assumption fails, okay? And so um, the zero conditional mean assumption is very delicate assumption. And so um, it's something that you must pay attention to. Okay. All right. Now um, let's uh, go on into the estimation process. So recall in the simple linear regression model, um, you know, we have the population regression function and we also have the sample regression function. And so what we have here is actually the sample regression function. How can you distinguish between a parameter regression function, a population regression function, and a sample regression function. One way that you can distinguish between population regression function and a sample regression function is that in sample regression function, um, you use the estimate uh, or less estimates, such as beta zeros hat, beta one hat, beta two hat, and so on until beta k hat. Okay. All right. So what was the idea and um, you know, OLS estimates in the simple uh, linear regression model? So in the simple linear regression model, uh, what we wanna do is we want to minimize the sum of square residuals of the model, okay? Um, and so by uh, choosing um, you know, estimates that minimizes the sum of square residuals that we're gonna have the best linear fit uh, of the model given the data, okay? Now, the idea is exactly the same. So what we wanna do is that we wanna choose um, estimates, beta zero hat, beta one hat, beta two hat, beta three hat, and so on, such that they minimize the sum square of residuals of the model. Now, it's very difficult to imagine if you have just Y and X, it's a, kind of like a one dimensional plot. And then you can see that uh, the line is going to repres represent the best fit given the distribution of Y and X. However, if you have more than two variables for your regression, then it's just going to be quite difficult to imagine it just because it's going to be beyond uh, a two dimensional plot, okay? All right. Okay, so I'm not uh, gonna ask you to do like the technical uh, derivation and stuff, but what I want you to do is, be able to understand why we try to pick estimates that minimizes the sum squared of the residuals, for example, okay? And so the estimates that you'll get um, is actually going to be referred to as the OLS estimates, okay? Now, again, um, it's going to be quite cumbersome for us to do the close from um, solution. Uh, and actually, we don't wanna do that. You know, in practice, you could be regressing on hundred of variables, some of you can be regressing with, um, you know, more than a thousand variable. And so doing a close form solution is not going to be ideal, uh, but what you can do or what the machine can do is actually use matrix algebra. Okay. And so with the use of matrix algebra, then you'll be able, um, you know, to calculate things uh, quite faster. Okay. Any question before I go and discuss interpretation? of multiple of you know estimates um, in the multiple linear regression model.
Okay. Um, so again, anytime, if you have any question, you can always, um, you know, unmute and then ask, okay? Make sure that um, you're not left behind, um, you know, in the, under, in the understanding of the materials and the concepts, because I'm going to be moving forward. I'm going to move forward and then I'm going to use, um, you know, the concepts that we discussed previously for discussion of the subsequent concepts, okay? So, uh, let's start with the interpretation uh, first. Okay, so in the general case, uh, you know what we get after we do the OLS regression is our um, the estimated intercept. Okay, and then the estimated beta one, which is the beta one hat, um, um, and also we're gonna have um, the estimated beta two, which is the beta two hat. Uh, we're going to have the estimated uh, beta 3, which is the beta 3 hat, and so on until beta k hat, okay? Now, the question is, what does beta 0 hat represent, okay? So from your, um, you know, from, from your notes last week, uh, anyone wants to share what's the meaning of beta 0 hat? Okay. So beta zero hat is going to be the average value of y when x1 is equal to zero, x2 equals to zero, x3 equals to zero, and so on, xk equals to zero, okay? So basically, again, beta zero hat represents the average uh, value of y when all of the explanatory variables equals to zero, okay? Now, again, in many regressions, we do not really pay attention to the beta zero hat. It doesn't mean that they're not useful. They have to be included in the model, but in general, we don't um, you know, uh, interpret the beta zero, okay? What we're interested in is actually on the beta one hat, beta two hat, and then beta k hat, okay? All right, so let's start with beta one hat, uh, beta two hat, and so on. So in general, be beta k hat, for any k have partial effect interpretations, okay? So what we're gonna do is that we're going, uh, we're going to interpret uh, the estimated coefficient one by one, okay? Now, if we do a partial uh, derivative of, uh, like a total uh, derivative of um, the, the sample regression function, then we're gonna get something along this line, okay? Now, what you want to do is that when you want to evaluate um, the effect of x1 on y, then what we're going to do is that we're going to have x2, delta x2 equals to zero. We're going to equate delta xk equals to zero. So what does it mean that delta x2 doesn't uh, is equal to zero? What does delta xk equal to zero? Delta x2 equals to zero, delta x3 equals to zero, and so on, delta k, delta xk equals to zero, it means that all the other variables do not change. The only variable that change is actually x1, okay? Now, x1, we're going to assume it's gonna change by one, so, okay? So if x1 changes by one unit, uh, then, y is gonna change by beta one hat, okay? So again, whenever we wanna do the interpretation, it's always easier if we set the change of x equals to one, okay? So if x changes by one unit, then y is going to change by beta one hat. All, as, all else constant. All else constant mean x2, x3, x4, uh, xk, are held constant. So that's going to be the interpretation of the model, okay? Now, any question uh, before I move into the next sli um, slide? Go ahead. I'm sorry, sir. Yes. Um, I want to ask actually about the previous one, but when we have a, like uh, this model, Using this model, it's okay, sir. We don't need to okay. go back. All right, go ahead. Like, for example, this model, if we see like this model in a simple regression model, there is like the U, the U is the unobservable variable. And we need to try to get um, 
zero conditional means that the u doesn't affect the the variable in the first one if the u is affecting the like for example the x1 but only a only a small small thing sir i mean the x1 will affect the y in a great term but what happen if the u is only affecting the the y but only in a small thing like a small thing does it means that it is unbiased or biased sir? i'm sorry sir my grammar is thank you that's fine so um so if i can recap uh, what you ask is that okay suppose that we have you know a factor or a characteristic that we do not observe um, and this uh, factor of or this characteristic that we do not observe is correlated with x1 and at the same time it's also correlated with y or the outcome of interest or the variable of interest okay and then you also subsequently said that uh, the correlation between the unobserved factors and the factor or, or the outcome of variable y is quite low or it's, quite, it's actually quite weak in that sense then yes we still fail the zero conditional mean assumption um yes the estimated coefficient of x1 is still going to be biased however the bias is actually going to be quite small okay uh, we'll see later on that um the, the size of the bias is uh dependent on uh, how big is the correlation between the factors that we do not observe as well as the uh, outcome variable of interest. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. Another example. Um, so in the wage equation, uh, we regress uh, labor market wage on uh, the years of schooling or the educational attainment. Um, we also include experience. Okay. So experience um, kind of like showcase your um, your uh, years of working experience in the labor market. So education itself um, is kind of like, uh, it, it, it shows the general human capital that you accumulate uh, through the school system. Uh, experience actually provides you, provides us with the illustration of the job specific uh, capital accumulation uh, that you accumulate over the years working in a particular sector or working in a particular firm. Okay. Now, what are we interested in? Of course, we're interested in beta one hat. We're interested in beta two hat. Now, take, let's take a look at beta one hat. So, beta one hat measures the effect of education on hourly wage, explicitly holding experience fixed. Okay. So, this is what we mean by controlling for experience. Okay, so by controlling experience, uh, we can kind of like uh, disentangle uh, whether this is the effect of education or whether this, this is the effect of experience. Okay, now if the assumption that the zero conditional mean is fulfilled, then the estimator is going to produce unbiased estimates, and the unbiased estimates are actually quite powerful. Okay. What do I mean by powerful? It's powerful because now we're able to estimate the effect of a variable in a non-experimental environment, which is uh, very rare. And then second, uh, experimentalists use a controlled laboratory experiment to keep other factors fixed. Now, if we're able to control for this variable, it means that these variables do not change. And the only variable that change is the variable of interest. So for example, if we're looking at uh, the effect of education on wages and we control for experience, then um, you know, this experience, uh, you know, we, we're actually comparing bit, uh, between people with the same experience, but different level of education. So that's what we mean by controlling for experience. Okay. Now, um, can we change more than one independent variable simultaneously? Uh, the answer is yes. However, we're not going to be able to identify, um, you know, the effect coming from a specific uh, variable that, um, you know, we conduct analysis simultaneously. Okay, until this point, any question uh, before I move uh, to the next one, uh, discussion on goodness of it? Okay. 
All right. So again, uh, quite similar with our discussion uh, last week, uh, we're going to try to decompose a uh, total variation. So SSD is going to be the total variation of uh, the Y variable. This is the uh, total variation of the data, okay? Now, SSE is going to be um, the proportion or like, uh, you know, the, so I'm gonna rephrase. So SSE is going to illustrate um, the total variation uh, by the, of the model, okay? And then SSR is going to be the total variation of the factors that we do not observe, okay? So from these quantities, uh, we can actually um, generate a particular, um, a particular statistic called the R square. Um, so R square is going to be the ratio between the, um, excuse me, R square is going to be the ratio between uh, the variation explained by the model and uh, the total variance, okay? So R square is going to represent uh, the variation of the data that can be explained by the variation of the model, okay? So for example, if you have an R square of 0 0.42, it means that, uh, you know, uh, the variation of the model can explain 42% of the variation of the, to the, to the total variation, okay? So that's going to be um, the meaning behind R square. Now, again, whether the R square is high or low, it doesn't really tell you anything about causality. Yes, higher R square uh, provides a better sense on whether or not the model is a good predictor or not, but it doesn't necessarily reflect a causal estimate of the model. In fact, these are two very different um, ideas. Okay. Now, uh, so I've said it before that a high R square does not imply that there is a causal interpretation. Um, again, and you know, uh, in the opposite, um, you know, side of the argument, a low R square does not preclude precise estimation of partial effects. Now, adding more variables, uh, both relevant or irrelevant, will increase R square. And so, what this is something that is not uh, particularly good. And so what we're gonna do is that we're gonna modify uh, the R square formula to be adjusted R square formula, okay? And so basically the adjusted R square imposes a penalty for adding new regressors. Now the adjusted R square increase if and only if the T statistics of the newly added regressor is greater than one in absolute value. And so if, you add explanatory variable that does not have explanatory power at all, then your adjusted R square is actually lower than uh, your previous R square, okay? But if the um, you know, explanatory variables that you include actually provide uh, the model with greater explanatory power, then the adjusted R square, R square will increase. Now, in some cases, the adjusted R square can actually take negative value, okay? Uh, these uh, are cases where uh, you include a lot of variables that do not have any explanatory power at all uh, to the outcome of interest, okay? All right, any question uh, before I go and discuss the cost Markov assumptions? Okay, cool. So uh, let me just recap. So what we did before uh, in the previous slides was that one, um, you know, we discussed why we need explanatory variable of interest. The idea is that a lot of the variables or the characteristics that uh, we observe, um, you know, will not be in the model. It cannot be explicitly controlled. And if we fail to explicitly control variable that are important uh, for the regression, then the estimated coefficient of your initial regression or the simple linear regression model will be biased, okay? Um, in some cases, uh, the bias is so large that you can actually switch sign, okay? So in, in the initial regression, um, the relationship between X and Y is positive, 
but then after you add control variables, the estimated coefficient change to uh, say a negative. And so in this particular case, there is a large bias um, for uh, not including the relevant variable. Okay. And then we discuss about the estimation and we discuss about the interpretation. And now we're going to discuss the cost, excuse me, the cost markup assumptions. So the first assumption is actually very similar. Uh, so it's linear in parameters. So beta zero, beta one, beta two, beta three until beta k are linear. Okay, and so that's the first assumption. The second assumption is also quite similar, which is random sample from the population. So this is very important. If you do not have a random sample from the population, then the issue is that you're going to have a bias estimate of the population. And the third assumption is called no perfect collinearity assumption, okay? So what does no perfect collinearity assumption means? It means that there is, there is variation in each, each xk and that no xk can be written as a linear combination of other regressors, okay? Now, it doesn't seem quite intuitive at this moment. However, we're gonna provide you with a short discussion on the no perfect collinearity assumption um, and then um, Helga will actually dig deeper in the tutorial session to provide you with how you should identify or try to detect perfect collinearity in your data set, okay? So it's a very simple module that you can run in Stata, so it's quite straightforward. Okay, um, so I'm gonna provide you with a conceptual example of perfect collinearity. Um, so in a voting outcome and campaign expenditure example, there are two candidates in each race, okay? Candidate A and candidate B. So let vote A be the percentage of the vote received by candidate A, and then share A be the percentage of the total campaign expenditure accounted for by candidate A. So what we wanna know in this model is that whether higher campaign expenditures is correlated with the amount of vote that you get, okay? Now, the issue is in this particular variables variable share A and variable share B, okay? Why is this a problem? Because share A is actually one minus share B. In other words, share A is a linear function of share B, okay? Um, moreover, it's actually an exact linear relationship, okay? So since share A plus share B is equal to one, then share A is going to be a linear function of share B. Okay, so in this particular case, we're going to be facing with the issue of perfect collinearity. We're gonna violate the third assumption of OLS, okay? Now, my question to you is that whether this particular specification violate the no perfect collinearity assumption. So what I have to emphasize is that the no perfect collinearity assumption refers to linear relationship, okay? So income and square of income is not a linear relationship. It's actually a non-linear relationship. So in this particular case, it doesn't violate the no perfect collinearity assumption. In fact, in a lot of the regression models, you can use non-linear variables such as income, square of income, years of working experience in the labor market, and then square of years of experience working in the labor market and so on, okay? Now, the issue is actually on um, this one, okay? Why is this an issue? Well, recall that a log of income square is actually similar to two beta two log uh, income, okay? And so we have log income and uh, two log income. It means that two log income is a linear function of log income. In this particular case, we violate the no perfect collinearity assumption, okay? And so this is the no perfect collinearity assumption, although, um, you know, um, 
is not really that uh, of an issue in general nowadays, since a lot of you guys are working with a relatively large data set. A lot of you guys are working with uh, relatively huge micro data. And so the issue of perfect collinearity may not be that severe, okay? But if you're working with limited data set, if you're working with a small data set, then a perfect collinearity is something that you have to pay attention to, okay? Okay, so that was the first three assumptions. Uh, the fourth assumption is the zero conditional mean. We've talked about zero conditional mean over and over again. The idea is that there are no unobserved factors that are still correlated with the variable of interest x1, x2 until xk, okay? In other words, uh, the variable of interest, say x1, is actually exogenous. It does not correlate with factors that we do not observe. And the last assumption, which is the homoscedasticity assumption, is another assumption that we've discussed in the previous lecture, okay? So the idea is that the variance of the unobservable are actually constant across different of x. Now, does this assumption make sense? In practice, it doesn't. So in practice, what we're seeing are heteroscedastic variables or heteroscedastic data, but for, you know, um, heteroscedastic uh, CD problem, we're going to address that in chapter eight explicitly. Okay. So again, going back to the assumptions, yes, assumption number, four, uh, number one matters, assumption number two, number three matter, but the main here is assumption number four, which is the zero conditional mean assumption. Okay. And if, this, if there are unobservable, that are correlated with the factors that we do not observe, then we get, or we have an issue of endogeneity, okay? So when you hear about endogeneity, particularly in the micro data, it means that there is a correlation between the factors that you do not observe and the variable of interest, okay? All right, so exogeneity or the um, you know, antonym of uh, endogeneity is actually the key assumption for causal interpretation of the regression, okay? So going back to the first, um, you know, discussion on birth weight and cigarettes. So is cigarettes endogenous or is it exogenous? So if the number of, you know, the number of cigarettes that you consume is actually exogenous, then it means that, okay, some uh, mighty, uh, like a mighty human being tells you that, okay, you should only smoke 10 cigarettes, you should smoke 20 cigarettes per day, and you don't, you should not smoke at all. So you'll see differences between those who do not smoke, those who smoke 10 cigarettes, and then you, those who smoke 20 cigarettes. But that doesn't make sense. We don't have that kind of like scenario. We don't have that kind of experiment. In fact, those kind of experiments are actually unethical and you know it would never be a study, okay? So we're never gonna be able to identify um, exogenous variation um, in uh, cigarette prices. For example, and secret consumption, for example. Okay, any questions on um, you know um, the cost mark of assumptions? So basically, assumption one until assumption five are quite similar with the assumptions that we see in the simple linear regression model. Although for the fourth assumption, we have something that is quite different and quite unique for um, multiple linear regression. Okay. Go ahead, if you have any question or you have any thoughts. Okay, all right. So the next bit is actually a very important part. So if you guys have any issue in understanding the idea of the next part, please let me know so I can go back and discuss the concept, okay? So this particular concept is going to be very, very useful, um, you know, for you to understand, um, for you to understand the materials. All right. So I'm going to compare two models, okay? So the first model is a model where we regress Y on just X1, okay? The second model is a model where we regress not only Y, but also X1 and X2, okay? Now, in general, 
the estimation that we get from the first model is going to be different with the estimation that we get from the second model, except, okay, except x2, uh, except uh, that uh, beta 2 hat is equal to zero or the covariance, covariance or the correlation of x1 and x2 is equal to zero. In other words, beta 1 tilde and beta hat is going to be similar except in the case where beta 2 hat is zero or there is no correlation between x1 and x2. Okay. Now this seems a bit abstract, but uh, let's give you guys an example. And so um, you guys are going to be, uh, you know, better off understanding uh, through an example. Okay, let me give you an example. So which uh, regression do you like better? Do you like the labor market um, example, the labor market wage education example, or do you like the birth weight and the number of cigarettes smoked? I'm going to use either one. Any suggestion? Which one do you guys like? For, for um, you know, example, uh, purpose of example, which one do you like uh, better? Which story do you like better? Okay. So uh, let's go with the birth weight. Okay. So we have uh, two models, okay? So the first model is a model that regress birth weight on the number of cigarettes uh, smoked per day during pregnancy, okay? Uh, the second model um, is going to be quite similar, okay? But in this particular model, I'm just gonna add one more explanatory variable. In this case is family income. Okay, now, do you think that beta one tilde and beta one hat are going to be similar or not? Are they going to be similar or they're gonna be different? And if they're similar, why? If they're different and why? Any thoughts? So recall that when I regress expenditure per student, okay, um, and then I add average income, the estimated coefficient changed quite uh, significantly. Uh, Fafa, go ahead. I um, think you wanna uh, give uh, us some answer. I think it will be similar, sir, because uh, in the uh, what a description below there, if beta uh, x and x two are not correlated, so it is correlated. So I think. It is uh, similar. So it's actually uh, you're you're going into the right direction. Um, so x one um, and x. Uh, so the first thing that we want to do is that um, the first thing that we want to establish is whether excuse me oops uh, first thing that we want to establish is whether beta beta uh, beta had to is zero or not. Okay. So in other words, is there a relationship between birth weight and family income? Yes or no? Yes, there is a correlation between family income and birth weight. So uh, basically in, in this case, uh, beta two hat two is actually not equal to zero, okay? And then what about the second one? So uh, do, family income correlate with the number of cigarette smoke? Could be correlated, uh, could not be correlated. We can argue that, oh, okay, um, individuals coming from richer background uh, may have a better or a higher uh, purchasing power. And so uh, they'll buy uh, more cigarettes than those uh, from the lower income family. So uh, X1 and X2 could be correlated, okay? But I suppose that um, family income and cigarettes are actually correlated, okay? So if family income and cigarettes are actually correlated, then the value of beta one tilde is actually going to be different with the value of beta one hat, okay? In other words, uh, the estimated beta one tilde 
from the short model is going to be different with the estimate uh, estimated per hour hat from the long model. Okay, from for uh, for the discussions or for the reasons uh, stated uh, previously. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is discuss a couple of scenarios. Okay, so suppose that we have an independent variable, and that independent variable is irrelevant. Okay. So an independent variable is irrelevant if the coefficient equals to zero, okay? That's, that was the first, first case that we discussed in the previous slide. So the true model is the following. So this is the true model. Do we know the true model? The answer is we don't know the true model, but suppose that this is the true model in the population. Now, if this is the true model in the population, and then you include an irrelevant variable of x3, then we're not going to get a biased estimate of beta 1 hat and beta 2 hat. In fact, beta 1 hat and beta 2 hat are still unbiased. Okay. Again, as long as it's linear in parameter, it's a random sampling, and then there is no perfect collinearity between x1 and x2. In those cases, then the estimate of beta one and beta two are going to be unbiased, okay? However, including irrelevant variables can have undesirable effects on the variances of the OLS estimators. So in particular, um, the variance of the OLS estimators are going to be higher if you include irrelevant variable into the model, okay? Now, going back to the discussion that we had last week, uh, is it preferable to have a high or low variance of the OLS estimators? Which one is preferable? High variance or low variance? Anyone? Low variance, sir. Yes. Low variance. Um, so in general, um, you know, uh, it will be preferable for us to get a lower coefficient, okay? Uh, sorry, a lower variance of the model, okay? Um, if we have a very high variance, then, um, you know, uh, we're not, we're not, we're not going to be confident with our estimate, okay? So very good. All right, so this is the first scenario. This is the first scenario in which we include irrelevant variable into the model. Now, let's discuss the second scenario, which is actually a more important scenario. And uh, this is something that you guys have um, to really understand, OK? So the second scenario is omitted variable bias. So omitted variable bias is a situation where there is a relevant variable in the model that you take out. or a relevant variable that you omit from the model, okay? And omission of a relevant variable from the regression is going to produce a bias. That's why it's called omitted variable bias, okay? Now, suppose um, that the true model is the following. Again, we don't know what the true model is, but suppose that this is the true model, okay? Now, if, this is the true model, then both x1 and x2 are important variable in explaining why, okay? But for whatever reason, we do not include x2 into the regression model. We know that x2 is a relevant variable for y, but for some, for some reasons, we do not include x2. For example, the data is not available, or perhaps the data is available, but the quality is really bad. So, um, you know, we cannot include it in the regression model um, or the variable is actually there, but you just didn't find it, for example, okay? So what will be the consequence if we leave out X2 from the model? The answer is our estimate of beta one in this particular case is going to be biased, okay? So recall the first example that we had. We have the birth weight on the left-hand side, and then we have 
number of cigarettes smoked uh, during pregnancy, okay? And we leave out, say, family income. And we know that family income is actually an important variable in the determination of the children's birth weight. And we leave out the family income from the regression. So we just have a regression of birth weight and the number of cigarettes smoked per day. Now, in that particular case, the estimate of the number of cigarettes per day is going to be bias, okay? And the bias is referred to as the omitted variable bias. Okay, any question before I go and discuss a more technical note on omitted variable bias? Go ahead. Oh, uh, sir? Yes, go ahead. Uh, about the nature of this bias, uh, do you think that uh, the cause of someone uh, committing this this uh, this omission is it uh, because they fail to include uh, the variable or or is it intentional that they remove the uh, the relevant variable? Yeah, so definitely you don't want to be intentional in the sense that you do not want to leave out a variable um, so that you get a result that is preferable to your hypothesis. Definitely, that's something that we don't want to do. And so uh, omitted variable bias is actually a theoretical concept, and it does have some empirical consequences, OK? For example, in some cases, we don't, we never see uh, X2 in the data set, OK? Suppose on the labor market uh, wage. So labor market wage is, um, you know, can be, uh, so we regress labor market wage on education, experience, gender, and so on and so forth, okay? But there is an important variable that we do not observe, and that variable is innate ability, okay? So if we go out, if you go out there and then identify, uh, identify surveys with, uh, you know, that allows you to estimate the uh, labor market wage education regression, it's actually quite difficult to find measure of innate ability, okay? So in labor market wage and education uh, regression, regression uh, we do not include innate ability just because we don't wanna include innate ability. We do not include innate ability just because those variable does not exist in the data. Doesn't mean that it does not exist in the real world. It's there in the real world. It's just, we don't see it in the data, okay? So that's kind of like the idea. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. So let's get into a more technical detail. Um, now, what we're going to assume is that X1 and X2 are correlated, okay? And we're going to assume that there is a, re a linear relationship uh, between the two, okay? Excuse me. And so what we're gonna do is that we're going to impute this X2 into here, okay? All right, and so if you follow the regression, you know, it looks long, um, you know, it looks tedious, but it's actually very straightforward. It's just a very simple uh, algebra. So if you can follow it and then do your exercise on your own, uh, that's gonna be beneficial for you, okay? And so after you plug in X, um, you know, after you plug in this equation into X2, then what you're gonna get is that you're gonna get Y only as a function of X1, okay? But now pay attention to the coefficient of X1, okay? The coefficient of X1 is actually now not beta one, okay? The coefficient of X1 is actually now beta one, plus beta two multiplied by delta one, okay? Again, the estimated value of beta one is now beta one plus beta two times delta one, okay? And what we can say is that beta two and delta one is actually the bias, okay? In particular, it's the omitted variable bias. This is the bias because we do not include X2 into the regression model, okay? Now, do we know whether the bias is positive or negative, okay?
okay? Now, whether the bias is positive or negative is going to be determined by the value of beta two and delta one, okay? Suppose, uh, so again, we have beta one plus beta two and then uh, delta t, uh, hat one, okay? Suppose that beta two is positive, Delta one is positive. What would be the bias? Positive and positive. So the bias will be positive. Okay. Now suppose that beta two is actually negative and delta one is actually negative. Then the bias is also positive. Okay. But whenever one is positive, the other one is negative. And then uh, the first one is negative, the other one is positive, then the bias will always be negative. Okay, so what is beta two and what is delta one? Okay, now beta two actually shows you the relationship between the variable that we omit and the outcome variable. Okay, I'm just gonna go back one slide so you're clear, okay? So uh, beta two actually shows you the relationship between X and Y, okay? So it's actually the effect of the omitted variable on Y. It could be positive, it could be negative, depending on the model and the um, data, okay? So that's uh, beta two. What about delta one? Delta one is basically the relationship between X one and X two. Okay, it's the relationship between the variable that we omit and the variable of interest x1. Okay, so again, beta two is the effect of x2 on y, and delta one is going to be uh, the correlation uh, between x1 and x2. Okay, if I make it more general, Beta two is going to be the effect of the omitted variable on the outcome variable. And then delta one is going to be the correlation between the variable of interest, the explanatory variable of interest, and the variable that we omit from the regression. Okay. So that's the idea of bias. And in particular, it's the idea of omitted variable bias. Okay. Any question, clarification about the bias? Okay, so again, the first thing that you want to do is that identify what is the variable causing the bias. Okay, so the first thing that you need to identify is uh, what will be uh, the variable that, um, you know, uh, drives the estimated coefficient to be uh, biased. From there, you're going to identify whether the bias is going to be positive or the bias is going to be negative okay so that's the idea again whether or not the bias is positive or negative is going to depend on the value of beta 2 which is the effect of the omitted variable on y and the value of delta 1 which is the correlation between the variable that we omit and the variable of interest okay and so i'm going to show you with the graph i can skip this because i already discussed this and I'm going to go straight into this slide, okay? So if beta 2 is positive, correlation is positive, we get a positive bias. If we have a positive bias, it means that we overestimate thing, okay? Um, if, uh, you know, the effect of beta 2 is actually negative and the correlation between the variable that we observe um, and the variable that we omit is negative, then we have a positive bias, okay? In other cases, we have negative biases, okay? So negative bias means that our estimate is actually lower than the true estimate, okay? So we can actually get a higher estimate, okay? Now, suppose that this is the case, okay? You have a labor market wage regression, okay? You have education on the right hand side, you have years of working experience, and then 
you have this classical innate ability variable that we do not observe. Okay. Okay. Suppose that uh, this variable, this population regression function, satisfies the cost Marcus Markov assumption. Okay. Now, because in a lot of the surveys we don't know uh, the value of ability, or we do not observe uh, the value of ability, and so. Uh, we're not going to be able to get that and include it in the regression. And so what happens is that we omit ability from this regression, okay? Now, my question to you is whether this estimated coefficient of 0 0.979 is overestimated or upward bias, or is actually underestimated or downward bias, okay? Now, to answer that, Let's do a quick. Um, let's do a quick. Um, let's do a quick uh, discussion. Okay, what do we omit? We omit ability. Okay, what's the relationship between ability and wage? Is it a positive relationship or is it a negative relationship? Positive, sir. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we can say that, or we can assume that it's a positive relationship, and it's actually a um, like a robust um, uh, relationship. And so people with better inner ability are more likely to have to get or to obtain higher wages in the labor market. Okay. Or are associated with. Okay. Now the second one is the correlation between the variable that we omit. And then the variable of interest, which in this case is education. Or we can also do it for experience. Um, is it positive? Okay, I lost my connection for a while. Um, so I'm just gonna try to repeat what I said, okay? Um, so again, the idea is that ability, which is the variable that we omit, has a positive correlation with wages, okay? At the same time, ability uh, also has a positive relationship with education, okay? And so if we have a positive correlation between the variable that we omit and the outcome variable of interest, and then at the same time, we also have a positive relationship between ability and um, you know the uh, the explanatory variable of interest. Do we have a case of positive bias, or do we have a case of negative bias? Any thoughts? Okay, so let's go back uh, to this uh, previous graph. So if the effect of the omitted variable is positive and the correlation between the omitted variable and the explanatory variable of interest is positive, what do you get? Do you get a positive bias or do you get a negative bias? Positive bias. Yeah. Good, so um, you get a positive bias, okay? So what does it mean to get a positive bias? You get a positive, uh, it means that the estimated coefficient of 0 0.979 is actually higher than the true effect of education, okay? So the true effect of education could be lower than 0 0.979, okay? So that's the idea of upward bias, okay? And it's actually um, empirically interesting to observe, okay? So um, please let me know if you have any question uh, before I'm going to go back to Stata and then I'm going to provide you with an example of uh, you know, omitted variable bias. Go ahead. Any uh, thoughts, any issue? Um,
Okay. Uh, sir. Yes, go ahead. Uh, what what if there is uh, more than one omitted variable? Yeah, very good. So what happens if you have more than one omitted variable? So what you want to do is just focus on one omitted variable that you know is quite key. Okay. So for example, in this particular case, um, we have omitted variable of gender. Okay. We have omitted variable on the employment sector. We have omitted variable on, uh, say, uh, the types of job that you have, okay? whether you're a manager, whether you're a production worker, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, But those omitted variables are actually more likely to be observed, and then you can include it in the uh, regression. However, for ability, it's quite difficult uh, to get ability from the data set, and so it's quite difficult for you to measure it. And so in that particular case, you can focus on that, okay? So basically uh, focus on the variable that you think it's very important in the determination of the outcome variable and a variable that is correlated with the education variable or the explanatory variable of interest and which is not going to be available in your data set. So that's gonna be the idea of omitted variable bias. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. Good. So I'm going to go in Stata and then I'm going to provide you with a simple illustration on uh, bias due to omitted variable bias. Okay. And so uh, for this um, exercise, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a uh, regression using the which uh, to data. Okay. So this is available on the Woolrich data set. So you just have to uh, download it and then um, use it uh, for um, exercise. Okay, so I'm going to do is I'm going to regress log wage, okay, with um, education, okay, and I'm going to hit run. Um, can anyone provide an interpretation of the estimated coefficient? So we discussed this um, in the previous week. So if we have lock of wage on the left-hand side, then we need to do something on the interpretation. Um, anyone recall what the interpretation is? Okay. So if you have um, lock transform variable on the left-hand side, and you have a label variable, level variable on the right-hand side, and so the estimated coefficient must be multiplied by 100%, okay? Now, in this case, the estimated return to education is 5.98%, okay? Why? Because we multiply this by 100%. So the estimated uh, return to education is 5.98%, okay? Now, suppose that I now include a measure of ability, okay? And the measure of ability that I include is IQ, okay? Now, given our, you know, last discussion, do you think the estimated coefficient will be lower than 5.98% or is actually gonna be higher than the 5.98%? So in our previous discussion, uh, if we omit, ability, are we going to get a positive bias or are we going to get a negative bias? Positive one, sir. Yes, we're going to get a positive, positive bias. Place. So if we're going to get a positive bias, it means that the estimated coefficient, if we include the ability or a proxy of ability, is going to be lower. Okay. Indeed, in this case, the estimated coefficient is lower. Okay. And so um, this actually provides you with a confirmation that there is indeed a omitted variable bias. If you fail to include a proxy or um, you know, uh, inability in your model, then the estimated coefficient that you'll get is going to be upward bias. It's going to be overestimated. It's going to be positively biased. Excuse me. So that's going to be the issue. If 
you forget uh, to include um, the um, ability variable. Okay. Now, since we discuss about um, you know a multiple linear regression model, I can now include a lot of uh, explanatory variables into the model. Um, I can include uh, the years of working experience. Um, I can include a variable on um, age. Uh, I can include also marital status. I can include whether or not I'm black. Um, and then I can also include whether or not I live in the southern part of the United States. I can include uh, whether or not I, you know, I live in the urban area. Um, I can also include the number of siblings. Why do we need to include the number of siblings into the regression model? What's the thought process behind it? Recall what we're interested in is investigating the return to education. Now, why do we want to include sibling? Or perhaps the number of sibling is correlated with the years of education. So suppose that you have a lot of siblings, then perhaps it's going to be difficult to send all children into college or universities. Why? Due to a budget constraint, for example, okay? And so in that particular case, uh, the larger the number of siblings, then the lower um, your education level is on average. Okay, so perhaps uh, you can include siblings. Um, we can also include the birth order. What's the thought process of including birth order in the regression to identify the returns to education? Any thoughts? We want to include birth order uh, because there could be preference from the parents for their firstborn children. Okay. Uh, again, there could be preference from the parents uh, towards the firstborn children. That would be the case. Okay. And so, you know, given that we have all of these variables, we can now uh, regress it. Okay. Now, again, what happens when you now include, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one more thing, uh, which is, um, actually forgot, um, let me see. I actually forget to include the variables that's important, which is the IQ. Okay, all right, so let's go back to this regression, okay? So when you just regress on education and when you just regress on education and IQ, the estimated return to education is 3.9. Now, once you include all the explanatory variables, the estimated return to education is about 5.12%, okay? So what does it mean? It means that the ability variable is an important variable. However, there are also other variables that are relevant to the regression. And if you fail to control or if you fail to include this variable, then your estimated coefficient will more likely to be biased as well, okay? And so what's the lesson learned from this discussion? Uh, the lessons learned from this discussion is that if there are variables that are relevant to your regression, and the data is available, you might as well include it in your regression model, okay? And if you fail to include uh, the relevant variable into your regression model, then the estimated coefficient will be biased, or there's a potential that the estimated coefficient will be biased, okay? That's gonna be the challenge that uh, we're gonna get. Okay, any question on this exercise? Um, so I provide you with uh, several two files and there is also an art script. Um, and so I think it's good for you to, you know, start uh, exercises. If you want to go, uh, you know, to learn Stata, you can use Stata. If you want to learn R, then you can use, um, you can learn R. It's really up to you. Um, so I think this is a good opportunity to choose. Um, you know, if you, are able to master particular programming, 
then it's quite intuitive uh, to use the other programming. Okay, so for example, if you know how to do R, it's going to be quite straightforward for you to do Stata. It's just a way of you know different uh, thinking of the data set and the other way around. So um, you know, invest your time in whichever you think is uh, useful at this point, and then later on you can you you know you can expand your capabilities. Okay, and um, I urge you not only to learn it for the sake of this class, but uh, if you're interested in data analysis, if you're interested in business analytics, uh, I think that's a uh, that's something that you need to learn, okay? Because the demand for demand analytics, business analysis, and then the demand for data analysis keeps increasing over the years, okay? So it would be nice to have one, a theoretically sound uh, data analysis, a theoretically sound business analysis, and then business analysis who knows, um, you know, uh, empirical stuff. I think the combination of knowledge on theory and knowledge on empirical side is going to be very helpful. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, we as a school wants to produce to the labor market. And so we can communicate policy better. Uh, we can communicate ideas better and stuff like that. Okay. Um, any question up to this point? Okay. Um, another thing that um, actually uh, is available on your um, on your do file is actually on um, excuse me uh, let me go back and check um, and so another thing that is also available uh, on your do file is what's called the residual versus prediction plot okay suppose that we do the regression and then after we do the regression I'm going to ask data to predict a variable and the name of the variable is R, which is the residual of the model, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do a residual versus prediction plot, okay? Now, what you can do is that we assume that the expected value of unobservable or residual is going to be centered around zero, okay? But for some values, you know, the distribution is kind of like uh, quite large, but for some variable, the distribution is quite narrow, okay? What does this uh, relate to? Anyone still remember? Sorry, I'm sorry, I cannot see the graph. Ah, oh, you're right. Uh, I'm sharing just the screen, so my bad. Thank you for reminding me that. Um, so hopefully now you're going to be able to see it, okay? Um, so just to recap, what I did was that I predicted the residual and then um, I did a regression versus a prediction plot, okay? And then uh, from this, uh, you can see a zero line. So zero line means that, uh, you know, the residual is expected uh, to vary around zero, okay? And so you can see for this particular uh, value of the fitted value, um, you know, we have a very large uh, variance. For this, we have a relatively low variance, okay? Um, so what does this mean? It means that uh, the variance is actually uh, different between values, okay? And so this is, an indication that we do not fulfill the homoscedasticity assumption, okay? All right, um, so this is a very preliminary, um, like a very preliminary way of looking at, uh, looking at whether or not we fulfill the homoscedasticity assumption or not, but um, this is one of the ways, okay? Um, later on, when we move on to the other chapters, we're gonna provide you with examples on how to statistically test for homoscedasticity, okay? For now, uh, let's, it, let, let's leave this as it, as it is, okay? All right, so I'm gonna switch uh, back uh, to the slide um, and gonna, we're gonna finish our discussion with a discussion on homoscedasticity um, uh, assumption, okay? So again, recall uh, from the discussion of assumptions, the fifth assumption is homoscedasticity. And last week we discussed that if we fulfill the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth assumption, then we can use the variance of the residuals um, 
as an estimate of the variance of the factors that we do not observe in the population. Excuse me. And then if you're able to estimate, uh, if, you're, if you're able to fulfill the uh, assumptions, assumptions Y, one to five, then you're going to be able uh, to get an estimate of the standard error, okay? Um, and then um, the estimate of the standard error will be later on used for inference um, and then to see whether or not a particular variable is statistically significant or not, which is going to be uh, discussed in the next meeting, okay? So let's go back and then see the components of OLS variances, okay? So basically a high variance increases the sampling variance because there are there is more noise in the equation, okay? So if you have a high error variance, then your standard error is gonna get larger and your estimate precision is going to be lower, okay? Again, ideally you wanna get a higher precision. A larger error variance is gonna make the estimates imprecise, which is exactly what I said. Um, and then the error variance does not decrease with sample size, okay? And so whether or not you have a very large size sample size or you have a very low a sample size is not gonna matter to the error variance, okay? Now, the total sample variation in the explanatory variable, which is the SSDJ, um, so more sample variation leads to a more precise estimates. Again, if you have a higher variation of uh, the variable of interest, then your precision of the estimate is gonna get larger. Why? Because uh, the variance and the standard error is going to be lower, okay? Total sample variation automatically increases with the sample size, okay? So if you have more sample, you have more variation in X, you have more variation in X, the variance is gonna go down, okay? Now, also increasing the sample size is a way to get a precise estimate. And so if you ask, um, you know, what would happen if we just have a 30 sample for our regression, then I'm going to ask you back, can you get more uh, sample um, as long as it's a random sample from the population, for example, because with a higher sample, then the sampling variation is going to go down, it's going to go down, the precision is going to go up, okay? And it's going to be very important for our discussion next week. Okay. Um, another one is the linear relationship among the independent variables. And this is going to be relevant to the, the idea and discussion on non, uh, no perfect collinearity, okay? What would happen if there is a perfect collinearity? If there is a perfect collinearity, the R square J is going to equal to one, okay? Why? Because it's highly correlated. It's actually a linear function of each other, okay? And so if R squared J is one, one minus R squared J is equal to what? Is equal to zero, right? Okay. What happens if you divide something by something that is close to zero? Okay, I'm gonna go back to the, uh, uh, go ahead, David. Uh, is it going to be a very large number? Exactly, very good. So recall, if you divide something with something that is approaching zero, then the variance is gonna get large. So theoretically, it's gonna approach infinity, okay? And so if you have variables that are perfectly collinear, with other variables, then the variance of that variable is gonna be very large. What happens if the variance is very large? Well, the precision of that uh, estimate is going to be very low and it's not gonna be preferable for your case, okay? Okay, um, and so basically what can we do? We don't have, we don't have a sigma square because um, you know uh, variance of the unknowns or the variables that we do not observe, uh, the variance of the variables that we do not observe is never observable. It's the characteristic of a population that we won't know. But 
as long as we fulfill the assumption one, two, three, and five, four and five uh, of the linear regression, then the variance of the residual is going to be an unbiased estimate of the variance of the unobservable, okay? So um, with that in mind, uh, then the estimated um, variance is going to be a function of uh, the residuals, the variance of the, uh, the total uh, sum square of the residuals, and then divided by n minus k minus one, which is the degree of freedom, okay? And so here you can notice that what happens if you have a higher n? If you have a higher sample size, then your, the variance of the residual is gonna go down, okay? In other words, it's gonna get uh, more precise, okay? And so uh, basically this is the idea. Um, if you have, um, if you have uh, fulfilled assumption one, two, three, four, and five, then your standard error, standard error is just the square root of the variance of the estimated coefficient is going to be a function of the variance of the residual variation of the exponential variable of interest, and then uh, the relationship with the other variables, okay? So let's just go one by one again. If there are more sample or the sample size is higher, then the variance of the residual decreases. If the variance of the residual decreases, the standard error also decreases, okay? So that's one possibility. Another one, what happens if you have more variation in the variable of interest? If you have more variation in the variable of interest, the standard error goes down, okay? And so this is ideal when you have um, like a interval variable or a continuous variable that, you know, varied quite a lot. The third one is um, the relationship with the um, other variables, okay? If there is no perfect collinearity, so this R square approaches to zero, if it approaches to zero and then the standard error um, is just going to be um, the variance of the residual divided by variation of the variable um, X, okay? But if this one is very, uh, if there is a perfect collinearity and this approaches to one, then this whole thing is going to approach um, infinity, okay? Um, and so the variance is going to get very, very, very large, which is not ideal in our case. Okay, so uh, again, um, I'm going to just recap. So the first um, four assumption, so assumption one to four, uh, linear in parameters, and then uh, sampling, um, you know, random sampling. And then the third one is no perfect collinearity and then zero conditional mean assumption. It's going, if you fulfill those assumptions, we're gonna get a non-bias estimate, okay, of the coefficient, okay? And now if you fulfill assumptions one, to five, okay, then what are you gonna get? You're gonna get what's called the best linear unbiased estimator, okay? So what do we mean by best? What we mean by best is that OLS estimator is going to produce the smallest variance among all other unbiased estimators. So this is kind of like the best estimators available because it's the one that's gonna produce the smallest variance of all um, regression um, estimators. And so if you fulfill the assumption of OLS, OLS is just perfect. OLS is just quite powerful. But again, it's going to be based on whether or not you're gonna fulfill the assumptions or not. Okay. Any questions uh, for the materials that we discussed today? So before I close the, uh, the discussion today, I'm gonna show you a uh, illustration of R, which is another software that you can use. Now, the good thing about R is that you don't have to pay for R. 
okay? It's actually open source um, and uh, you can use it for uh, your exercise as well. Any question uh, before I uh, move and provide you with an illustration using R? Okay, so I don't expect you to really understand the materials just from this uh, lecture. So what I want you uh, guys to do is again, uh, sit down and then read the, uh, you know, the book chapter. Uh, make sure that you take note of concepts that, um, you know, you do not understand and then try to relate it back to the lecture that we had today. Um, the second thing that I want you guys to do is, um, you know, if you can, after you learn and then do your independent learning, um, just, you know, go meet your friends for 15 to 30 minutes and then just exchange uh, concepts, okay? Just to make sure that, um, you know, uh, everyone in the group or everyone in the study group understand the concepts um, and that's gonna help you when you do your problem sets, okay? Um, all right, so I guess I can uh, provide you with a, uh, you know, an illustration of, um, R. Okay, uh, let me share the screen. Okay, so this is called uh, the R Studio. Okay, um, so the R Studio is kind of like a user interface platform that allow you to use the R in a kind of like a, like a more efficient um, and a more organized way, okay? Um, you don't have to install RStudio, but it just looks better and it makes, um, you know, coding much more easier um, in RStudio. So before you install RStudio, what you need to do is install uh, the R uh, program, okay? Uh, so you can download it in the uh, uh, CRM project um, and then, you know, there are some um, servers that you can download the R project from. And then after you download it and then you complete the installation, you can then install R Studio. okay? And after you install R Studio, then uh, you can start um, kind of like uh, your analysis, okay? So uh, I posted several examples of um, R. Um, so in this particular case, I'm going to show you um, example using the CEO salary data from Jeffrey Woolrich uh, textbook. Now, the first thing that you want to do is that uh, you want to install several library. Okay, um, so this library um, is going to help you with different um, analysis and different, you know, uh, graphical capabilities. So, for example, in this particular case, I install uh, ggplot. So, ggplot is going to help me uh, to do uh, plotting and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so, you know, the idea is just quite similar with Stata. You have a list of syntax that you can do. Um, and then I'm going to set the working directory here. Um, and then I'm going to also upload the uh, Stata data. Okay. Um, and given the Stata data, I can do several analysis. So, for example, I can do a um, scatter plot, for example. Okay, um, so the scatter plot is going to provide me with an illustration on the relationship between sales and CEO salary. Um, I can also do, say, excuse me, data transformation. For example, I can also change uh, or make a log transform variable instead of salary, but I'm going to use uh, log salary and then log sales. Okay. Oops, excuse me. Okay, and then from this, I can also do a scatter plot on the uh, log variable. Uh, and so we can see that there is a relationship uh, between uh, total sales and then CEO salary. So if your firms generate higher sales, then uh, your CEO salary tends to be higher. Okay, so that's kind of like the idea. Um, and then you can also do regression here. Okay, so suppose that you regress the salary of the CEO on the sales data, okay? And then after you uh, run the regression, um, you ask uh, R to estimate it. So the estimated coefficient is uh, 0 0.256. 
and recall the regression. So the regression is on variable that is locked transform in both sides of the equation. And if you have log transforms on the both side of the equations, what do you get uh, for the um, estimated coefficient? Anyone recall? If you do a double log uh, regression, what's the interpretation for the coefficient? So the interpretation- Elasticity, sir. Exactly. Uh, very good, Matthew. So it's going to be elasticity. Um, and so this particular exact, uh, this particular estimation refers to the elasticity between salary and sales. So if sales changes by 1%, then um, lock salary is going to change by about 0.256% cataris paribus, okay? Uh, that again, assuming um, zero conditional mean, okay? We can also do multiple linear regression, for example, uh, excuse me, not only that I include, um, you know, sales, but also um, return on equity, ROE. So return on equity is also another measure of firm's performance. Um, and it also provide, you know, uh, uh, shareholders a uh, better value if they have higher ROE. And so uh, they tend to, you know, uh, have a better um, salary. And so, what you can do is that after you include the return to in, on equity, yes, the estimated uh, you know coefficient for the log sales changes, but not by much. Okay, um, it's a, still around the zero point twenty five six percent that was estimated in the previous model. Okay, um, however, now with the ROE, it provides you with a better description of. Um, you know, the factors that affect the CEO salary uh, in, in firms, okay? And so uh, this is the illustration of using R for data, very simple data analysis and for regression analysis. And so uh, you actually have a choice on uh, which tool that you want to use for, uh, you know, for learning. You can use R, you can use data. I think um, it's going to be uh, down to you. It's going to be very uh, quite straightforward uh, to learn. And so please do spend some time to learn. Again, not, not for the sake of just learning it, but to actually to build human capital um, and to build technical skills that is going to be useful for uh, future purposes. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's going to be the lecture for today. Um, any questions from um, you guys before I close the session? All right, um, it's been a long lecture, uh, it's almost two and a half hour. Um, so thank you everyone, uh, stay safe and stay healthy and I'll see you guys next week. Don't forget to do the problem set as well as the quizzes, okay? Um, and make sure again to read the relevant chapter and please understand the key uh, concepts and so to better, to, you know, to better understand um, you know, the issues that were discussed today. All right, I'll see you guys next week and uh, have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. 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 Have a great day. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Have a good day.